Welcome back and welcome to all of you who are joining us via YouTube. Thank you very much. This webinar is part of our plans to launch an emerging talent scheme that sets to improve inclusion and diversity in the natural history industry across the world. We will be uh, empowering the next generation of wildlife filmmakers and conservationists with inclusive mentoring masterclasses and internship opportunities. This will be initially trialled in Bristol and the UK with a view to making it as accessible with our global park partners and thereby making it a truly international offering. We're doing a number of things to fund the scheme. And one of them is through this very t-shirt that I am wearing. It's a lush design that is available to pre-order on a limited edition climate neutral earth positive tea until this Sunday, the 25th of April. For every two t-shirts that are sold, it allows Wildscreen to empower three more emerging talent individuals with free access to their training scheme. The t-shirt is designed by artist Tom Abbas Smith and the artwork on the back, which I will try and show you, I have no idea if you can see this properly, but here you go, um, is basically uh, highlighting two species that have been seriously impacted by climate change and are suffering from severe population decline. They are the lemur leaf frog and small tortoise shell butterfly. Gabby will pop a link in the chat both here on Zoom and on YouTube. And I should say that Gabby is our events and um, comms manager here at Wildscreen and she's supporting me behind the scenes um, on this webinar. So let's uh, continue with uh, what all of the other activities that we're up to here at Wildscreen with regards to fundraising towards developing this world leading programme. As of yesterday, right through to next Thursday, the 29th of April, we are raising funds via the Big Give. The Wildscreen team were litter picking inland in Bristol yesterday, having collated almost 1,000 pieces of litter. Uh, Wildscreen interim CEO Sue is challenging herself to complete a 10 mile run around Richmond Park. I'm going to be doing a solo beach clean from 8 a.m. until 10 a.m. this Sunday to pick up 100 or more bits of litter, um, which will then be surveyed and shared with the Marine Conservation Society. And CEO of Wildscreen, Lucy, has committed to completing a 10 mile walk with her son Elwood in tow, and he'll be in his pram. We are accepting donations by the Big Give, who will be much funding our campaign up to two and a half thousand pounds, increasing the impact of donations received. So um, Gabby will also put a link into the Big Give where you can make donations. Getting back to today's webinar, it will give you a taster um, as to what you can expect to learn by gaining a place uh, on our Emerging Talent Scheme. Do pop your questions in the Q&A box and we'll also be monitoring the questions coming through from YouTube. Please note that I may not be able to ask every question in the time that we have available. Right, let's make a start. So first of all, uh, I wanted to introduce you to uh, British Bangladesh ornithologist, environmentalist and campaigner for equal rights, Maya Rose Craig, aka Bird Girl. She's going to be opening up the event with a pre-recorded video for us. And joining us on the panel today is Dee Hassam, who recently joined renowned Bristol-based independent production company, Icon Films, as a runner earlier this year. Um, followed by Amelia Erdhart, who is an international student currently studying an MA in wildlife filmmaking at the University of the West of England, and is actively working on her own wildlife filmmaking projects and photography projects as well. And then finally, we have established wildlife presenter, independent filmmaker and PhD candidate biologist Dan O'Neill, who recently directed and presented a four part series for BBC Earth, exploring the conservation of snow leopards in the mountains of Kurdistan, which is pretty amazing. So 
Now it's time to hear from Maya Rose Craig. I'm going to share a video on my own screen and um, play that for you now. So please be patient while I sort all of this uh, sharing screen now. Hi, I'm Maya Rose Craig, also known as Bird Girl, and I've always loved bird watching, nature and the outdoors. I'm really lucky because I've been taken out into the countryside and out into nature literally since I was a baby, and birds have always been a really big part of my life. And that's partially why I started my blog, Bird Girl, when I was 12. I never particularly expected anyone to read it, but it exploded in a way that I never expected and it gave me so many amazing opportunities. Um, I've been able to do all sorts of activism and campaigning, especially through my charity, Black to Nature, which is all about diversity in the countryside and environmental spaces. But I've also been able to go on TV and various other types of media, lots of times as well, which is really exciting. Um, which doesn't mean, I guess, that it's been smooth sailing the whole time that I've been doing stuff online. I definitely think, especially when I was younger, as a woman and a Bangladeshi person, um, I faced a lot of, I suppose, hatred online that I otherwise don't think I would have experienced. And I experienced a lot of, um, I suppose, discrimination that I otherwise wouldn't have experienced. And I think that that definitely sh shaped the way that I think about social media and the way that I felt about the people already involved in the creative industries. Um, but despite that, I think it's so, so important to have people push forward into the industry and create role models because one of the most important things, in my opinion, is to have people from all different backgrounds and all different walks of life, um, I suppose, engaged with or working in the creative sector, especially within the natural history industry, because I truly think that that's how you're going to get loads of other people externally um, to become engaged as well. So those are inspirational words and encouraging words there from Maya Rose Craig. Um, I believe that video played out well, so uh, hopefully everybody did see that. Um, we, we will make that video available on our YouTube channel as well after this webinar. Now it's time to get talking to our guests. First up, we have Dee. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she is a runner at Icon Films. So welcome, Dee. How are you doing? Hi, uh, I'm well. I'm currently at work. Uh, just on a little break to do this webinar. Thank you very much um, for taking the time out to join us. I really do appreciate it. Let's get cracking with the questions I had for you. And I, um, I wanted to be able to uh, show share with the audience what got you interested in taking up a career in filmmaking and TV for you? Um, I think it was a variety of things, but to begin with, it was just a general love of films. Um, and like knowing that I can't think of another medium that's as powerful and as impactful as like visual um, media in like changing people's ideas and spurring people into action when it comes to preserving the natural world or learning something new about animals or just generally, I think it's just an, an amazing medium to be a part of. So I think that's why I started off going into journalism at uni because I thought maybe I would like to write, but then I did a module in visual journalism and I really took to it and I was like, yeah, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. That's amazing. And was there a specific memory that triggered this desire for you that you just thought that's that's the industry I want to get into um kind of it sounds a little silly but there was these countdown shows of like the world's most dangerous animals um when I, I used to watch when I was a little and I thought they were just the most amazing thing in the world and I used to like rush home from school and sit and watch those and I didn't think it was something I was going to do when I grew up I just thought it was like an amazing show and 
I think through just working in life and just ending up in certain roles, I got exposed more and more to it and I realized that it might be a viable path and I can actually do it. So, yeah. And just explain to us uh, how you got into your role as a runner. Talk us through your, the experiences that you gained around some of the projects that you worked on and the skills that you developed over time and, and some of the organizations that you linked up with as well, because it's a really interesting backstory you have. Uh, yeah, um, so after I finished university, I was, I was just working just odd jobs in customer service and retail. And um, I started in my free time, I started working with a local media center on just as a filmmaker's assistant, doing little bits for local nonprofit organizations and charities, just helping out when I had some free time. Um, sometimes as a volunteer, sometimes as a paid volunteer. Um, and then I wrote, like I started pitching articles to local youth magazines about um, sustainable practices in local communities um, that I am part of. And I think eventually that led me to being part of a program, not unlike um, Emerging Creatives that um, has been pitched here, that is, um, it was taking 12 people from disadvantaged backgrounds and sort of exposing them to creative industry here in Bristol. And I got a job as a junior producer, digital producer at the Media Center as a volunteer. Um, and we start, they taught us how to pitch videos, um, how to like, write proposals, take meetings, and then film and edit like little five minute videos for like prospective clients. And part of it was going on industry placements in around, in and around Bristol, and one of them was Wild Screen. That was with for a few weeks part of the Wild um, Screen Film Festival. Uh, and then I think from the connections I made at Wild Screen at, at other placements at the Media Center, I got an interview here at Icon, and I've always loved Icon. I thought it was such an amazing company. And, here I am now. That's amazing and huge congratulations to you once again and um, I I was involved uh, in the in the hiring process when I, I had a, a short stint at working at Icon Films earlier this year and um, it was just amazing to see all of the proactiveness that you had been um, doing towards getting this goal as a, 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 a of obtaining a a job in the natural history industry and I think the key there is linking up with all of those local organizations and uh, I, I acknowledge that in Bristol there are a lot of those um, media organizations locally that really do help young creatives aren't there. Mm -hmm. And what were the challenges that you had overcome along the way? Um, because you're part of an in immigrant family, aren't you? And you've lived in Sweden. So can you just talk us a little bit through your um, your your journey? Yeah. Um, sure. So I um I, I as you said, I was um, I'm from Sweden. I moved here when I was fourteen, and my mom came to Sweden as a refugee from Somalia. And when we moved here, I was the first person in my family that really went to college or university. And that meant that when I finished university, I didn't really have any connections in any real industry. Like my parents were working as like cleaners and doing such an amazing job of supporting me at home. But they, I just didn't have many connections in the family. And even as a path to work in the creative industry, which meant that I worked in customer service and retail for a long time. A lot of my peers were also working in customer service and retail. And um, so I think that was the biggest challenge, just not knowing where to turn to. Because um, applying for jobs, even as a runner, they kind of want you to have some kind of experience. And it's really hard to get experience when you have to have experience to get experience. And it was that weird, vicious cycle. So I, after applying to a couple of hundred places, I just gave up and started working. and. Once you work, it's like four hour weeks. Um, you don't really have the capacity to keep looking. So I spent a couple of years just working and I lucked into the program because in my free time, I was just hanging out at the body center. I've made some friends there and I started helping out and they learned my name and start sending me opportunities every now and again. 
and the article as well. I sort of walked past Work Magazine and, and talked to someone there. And I think a lot of it was just luck, maybe. maybe there was, I was being proactive, but a lot of it was just sort of lucky into stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we've we've had some um, questions come in from the audience already, and I was going to wait until the end um, to to ask those, but um, I, I will ask you this one that's come through, and it says, "What is some of the best advice you've ever received?" So, what advice did you receive from, uh, particularly, I guess, from the creative organisations that you had linked up with? Um. I had this one um, at a different film festival I had that I was placed with for a couple of weeks. Um, a mentor that gave me really good advice about being treated every job as this the most important job that you have. Like not, like I know that I'm working as a runner right now and it's not the, the highest position in this company, but it's if I'm really enthusiastic and I care about what I'm doing and I, I care about um, making the production go smoother by doing my job well, then I could move forward and start doing something else. Yeah, that was pretty good advice. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that's great advice. Thank you, Dee. I mean, I'm going to move on to talking with uh, Amelia now. Amelia, if you can, uh, that's, that's great, thank you. I was just <laughs> gonna say, don't do what I did at the beginning. <laughs> um, I've been waiting for, yeah, getting it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, Amelia, we've talked a little bit about the fact that you're a, a wildlife filmmaking student at uh, the University of West of England. So I wanted to get a sense from you, what got you interested in studying wildlife filmmaking in the first instance and, and, and um, why you want to kind of forge on and, and make a career out of it? Mm. Well, I think um, for me, it, it definitely wasn't what I thought I was gonna do or go into. Um, as a child, I just, I loved animals. I love animals. And for me and for the people around me, it made sense that if you love animals, you become a veterinarian. Basically, that's what you would do. Um, and I would always, I love watching animal shows and Animal Planet. And I would always have a fight with my sister over the remote because she wanted to watch anything else. <laughs> but I really wanted to watch all, all the stuff on Animal Planet. And discovery so I always had a love for these shows like they were saying just really enjoying them but never considering them as something I could do or a career so I grew up and I thought I was going to be a vet and then I realized by doing I did little internships and helped out in the local like local vet clinic doing summer stuff um, and I realized that it was more this the work that the veterinary nurse, the technicians were doing was a lot more interesting to me because that was about the animals and working with the animals and the behavior and not so much the operation side of it and um, all the medical stuff. So I was like, right, then I'll become a veterinary nurse and that's my life. Like I can't wait to do it and just get into it. And I got into the, the, the study and you do a lot of placement while you do it. And after a few months, I was like, oh no, this is not what I want to do. What then is it I want to do? Because I didn't know about the fact that you can study animal behavior a lot of other places in the world because in Denmark and Norway we don't have that as a degree or really anything you can become a vet or maybe a zookeeper so I did stop that other study and went to do managed to go to Norway and did some work with uh, wolves and some other arctic animals for a while and somehow found out that I can actually study animal behavior in the UK. And I thought, right, I can just learn about animals all day. That's brilliant. That's what I want to do then. So I went to the UK, managed to get into a study here and did my undergrad in England. And whilst doing the undergrad, I did a placement year and I went different places across the world and worked with animals in the field, did animal research. And I loved it, but I could see that there was a tendency for me quite naturally to want to share the stories. And I realized every time I watched a documentary, my thought was just, wow, imagine having not so much your name on the credit list, but being part of the people who made this show, who made this magical thing that I just watched. And it hadn't really, I guess, you know, manifested in my brain that 
I had to go that way because I didn't ever think of it as a career option. But I had heard about this, um, the MA I'm on now, and I had looked at it, I think since high school. I knew it was a thing, but no one in my part of the world knew that you can actually do it for real. So through doing those of work and different experiences, then going to uni and doing experiences with uni or through that placement year, I finally thought, right, I think I have enough in my, you know, experiences and portfolio to apply for this MA. And, and then I got in, which is just amazing. But yeah, it's not been a straight road at all. <laughs> yeah, I know. And congratulations on, on having obtained that place. And uh, as an international student, and you've, you've already told yeah. us that you're originally from Denmark, how did you fund coming to the UK to study an MA in wildlife filmmaking? Because we've got a lot of people here in the audience from all over the world, and they, they're going to be thinking that very same thing. How, how did you make it happen? So can you talk us through that process? I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Still kind of am, but I was um, working very hard to apply for all types of grants and funding um, that I could find that I could somehow relate to going abroad and studying something um, in Denmark because I was I am very aware of the fact that I grew up in a country that's just in general very privileged and we have a really high quality of welfare we have a system that works you get education for free you know healthcare takes care of you and although I couldn't just ask the state to pay for my um, MA abroad I could definitely work to apply for all these grants and funding and help and it all added up and that's how I could fund going here and living here um, in Bristol and doing this MA. It, yeah it, it is it is fantastic that you've been able to source that help and um, thank you for making the point that actually you 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 acknowledge that that you there is that kind of privilege there available to you because of the country that you um, that you're from and the, the, that infrastructure that is in place. Um, equally, though, it, it wasn't handed to you on a plate either, and that you did have to work really hard to obtain all of that funding and justify um, the funding as well, which um, is is really interesting to hear. What other things have you been doing with your passion for the natural world? to support your studies. Um, you've mentioned that you, you managed to, to travel to Norway to, to study wolves and film wolves. What else have you been up to? Um, well, I think part, I get kind of where it came from was very organic because when I went to the wolves, as you mentioned, I was so over the moon to be able to go and do this work. And I was quite aware of a lot of people are not able to do this. And if I was not able to do it, I would have loved someone to tell me what they were doing. So I wanted to share what I was lucky enough to get to do with people who might not be able to, to go or do this work. And that's why I started like a photo blog and with every photo and video I put on there, I would tell about my work, tell about the animals, tell about the behavior. And that then led into when I did uh, my undergrad and travel around different places of the world and did animal research, I worked basically it's made an Instagram and a lot of my Instagram would then be about this work because again I wanted to share what I was lucky enough to go do with people who might not be able to do it for any whatever reason um, and I just love I love a good camera um, I love working with uh, the camera and and being able to share what I'm yeah lucky enough to go do so doing a, a photo blog for a project and doing Instagram just to share um, and then I was lucky enough to also join the this is my wild screen tea it's very comfy by the way it's the comfiest t-shirt I've ever I mean it's very good <laughs> no no lie and um, so I, I was part of the wild screen team in 2020 as a volunteer because it was virtual I was able to jump on that train um, whilst I was sort of working out coming to Bristol and starting this MA so that was quite helpful actually for me that it was virtual that <laughs> this year yeah we definitely um wanted to utilize the, the virtual technology that was out there to support the delivery of the festival to make it a, as accessible as possible and you know we we managed to reach uh, people in 42 countries through through the festival which was amazing so i'm glad that being able to offer that virtually for you was um was an added bonus while you were still um, trying to sort your life out coming here to bristol to sort uh, to study um 
I have spotted a question that is relevant, but I'm conscious of time and I, I do want to move on to speaking with Dan now. So thank you very much, Amelia, and um, we'll chat to you again when we, we, when we do the Q&A. Hi there, sure. Dan, how are you doing? Hey, yeah, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing really well, thanks, really well. Let's um, get stuck into your um, questions. And I, um, I wanted to ask what your route was into the natural history industry, both as a, as a presenter and a wildlife filmmaker, because you've done lots. Uh, first off, Dee and Amelia, that was really interesting. It's great to hear your stories and how you're kind of working along towards getting into a career in wildlife filmmaking as well. Um, slightly similar to Amelia, I did that master's that um, uh, Amelia's on right now. Uh, and I would like to start this by saying that master's was transformative. It's one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And I would not be anywhere close to where I am now um, or even at all if I hadn't done that masters. So that was, yeah, hugely massive. Big up to Peter Venn, the course director who runs it because yeah, he's a wizard. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, I, um, I did zoology at university, but long before that, I was just like the, re uh, the rest of us, really interested in animals as the kid that was uh, taking bird, like injured birds out of the classroom uh, when I was at school. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's not always been uh, a straight road. Uh, it, I think a lot of the time, especially with people like presenting wise, you always hear the bravado and the story of why it's like, I did this, I did that, I did this, and this is how I've led to, and they don't like to talk about the actual difficult parts, but there were, I mean, I left school when I was 16. Um, I did my GCSEs. I didn't really know what I wanted to do at that time. Cause as a kid, I dreamed of being a wildlife presenter, but just like, how everyone else was saying, I couldn't see an easy route into that. I had no links into it. It felt like one of those kind of moonshot ideas that like I come from a, a family where they were like, you need to, you know, have something concrete. You need a job that's like going to make you money. Um, so I was stuck between arts and sciences. I loved arts. I loved um, drama, I loved art, I loved filmmaking. I did, I, w I went to a charity kind of film school back home and like did little courses in video production, made the worst films that I can't take off the internet um, uh, <laughs> when I was younger. Um, literally, they're still there and they haunt me to this day. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I left school when I was 16 and I uh, got a job in a noodle restaurant and I uh, like worked to make money. I like, got my first flat, uh, like rental outside my parents' house. And I was really figuring out what I wanted to do. And then I kind of realized, no, do you know what? I'm gonna pursue my dreams, whether that's as, in, as a wildlife presenter or a filmmaker or in biology, biological sciences. And I thought the best way to do that, to travel the world, was to do uh, zoology. And so I worked really hard. I went to uh, a college, I went back to school and I got my um, higher education, like um, A-level equivalent and went to Sheffield Uni, which was transformative for me. It was amazing um, seeing these lectures on animals and every part of school that I just loved was in one place and we were doing animal diversity we were learning like mathematics behind animals and i yeah that was just yeah incredible incredible experience and during my time at sheffield um i was very involved in societies and i would say that if somebody is at university now or they're considering going to university societies for me were so big i found a community there in um, that we'll get on things related to what we'll get on to later. But I found communities there that like were really helpful to specific things that I dealt with in my life. Um, but also I joined Forge TV, which is Sheffield's TV station and started making, um, uh, presenting <clears throat> little documentaries about the history of the university and stuff, which was really, really cool and had a really good time. So those ones ended up being almost as valuable as my university degree. Um, but when uh, I was a uni as well, I got an opportunity to go and work in um, Guyana, which ever since I've been working, I've been going back to Guyana almost every year for 10 years now. Uh, and I was working there as a research biologist in this um, forest that was given to the Commonwealth in 1991, um, uh, basically for research and development. So we were looking at one side of the jungle as a uh, source of sustainable use. Um, and the other side is a wilderness preserve and camera trapping, ca uh, doing mist netting and lots of different sorts of surveys. 
uh, to see if sustainable use as a model can work uh, run by indigenous people. And actually it's really interesting because it does work and indigenous people who own their title lands in these areas of the Amazon can actually be the, be the complete and total stewards of the environment and use it without losing it. So it's really interesting. But yeah, after uni, again, similarly to um, Amelia, I worked as a, a research biologist for a few years before joining that MA, uh, making lots of little films along the way. And I guess that was what kind of led me to doing it. Um, That's amazing. That's, and thank you for sharing like your whole kind of life story as well as, you know, Dee and Amelia, you've done the same too. I think it's just really interesting and empowering for emerging talent watching this that, you know, you can make it work if you, you haven't had the best start in life or you don't have the connections or, um, the, you know, it, it, it's it, it's not an easy road, but it's doable and manageable. And that's really encouraging to hear. What um, what were the challenges that you had to overcome as a person, um, Dan? Because you identify as being part of the LGBTQ plus community. And there's been some recent PR um, uh, around that um, uh, uh, for you. So can you talk a little bit about that for us? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, I think for lots of people, especially in my community, but loads of other kind of uh, diverse backgrounds, uh, it's something that's like, it's a struggle you have your whole life. And, and being a gay man, it's, uh, there's a lot of shame when you're younger that you like, typically will I like, informs all decisions you make, whether that's with your family, your friends, with um, people that you go to school with, even just with strangers, there's that battle that you have. Um, and it's a massive thing you have to overcome, you know, coming out is huge. And in the UK, the average age to come out, you know, it's a lot older, some, in some, I think it is, is about 30 years old. So it's a, it's a big thing that people have to overcome. And I was grappling with that whilst, you know, trying to pursue a life in wildlife uh, conservation and film and all of these other things um, but I think it's really important and just as Maya was saying um, I really resonated with what she said in that video because she said talking about how role models are so important because outside of a diverse community or from a marginalized community it might seem a bit like difficult to understand that or to be able to grasp that quite so easily how important that is but when you're growing up uh, I mean, we spoke about this with the eye paper, but it's you can't be what you can't see. Um, and it's really difficult to to feel like you can pursue something when everybody who's doing that doesn't look like you or act like you or seem like you or have that innate part of you that you think, oh, God, that's holding me back. And, and because of that, I really did um, struggle to kind of connect those dots, especially in a presenting world, because there were no, there was no one like me, especially doing um, exploration and adventure and like that sort of dangerous activities. Um, and uh, yeah, there has been a few times uh, in the past where that's been brought up, whether it's people saying like, really you, that's, that's strange that you would do that sort of thing. Or like, that's not kind of the remit <laughs> someone from the LGBTQI community um, uh, and then even all as, as far as uh, a couple of times when people have been like he's a bit like Kempo he's a bit gayer than we expected uh, and that's not really what we're looking for for this kind of idea of this series for example um, and at the time I was like oh okay god I should probably like tone that down a bit and I really didn't think too much more of it at the time and then I was like hang on a minute no this is actually not right because why should that define what a person does or acts like? And there are many people just like how I was when I was a kid who would see somebody doing that and be like, now nah, I can do that and I want to do that. And so, yeah, I think it's super important to, to spotlight people of all different kinds of diverse backgrounds so that people feel like there's a place for everyone. And that goes towards companies as well in terms of making money, because when you have a diverse set of voices behind the screen, in front of the screen, across your entire company. You have a diverse set of, uh, of perspectives, of contacts, of like lived experiences, which increases the value of your product. So I think it's important across the board. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, we've had a really lovely comment come through on the chat from Darwood Qureshi. I hope I've um, pronounced your name correctly and apologies if I haven't. Um, he says it's not a question, but to see Dan making documentaries, speaking about these issues on the big screen and to be linked to wildlife conservation and filmmaking and representation 
is so uplifting because I'd never seen someone who is gay and in wildlife conservation in any representative role. Thank you for all that you do. Oh, that's really that's sweet. Part. Thank you. That is really, that is really lovely. Um, right, I, I wanted to ask, um, you've actually um, covered this in your, in your previous uh, answer, but just to kind of reiterate why you think it's important to support emerging talent from diverse backgrounds and, and what advice, actually, yeah, what advice would you give to emerging talent today wanting to make a career in this industry? Um, well, yeah, what we were just saying, I think, is the most important reason as to why um, we're, it's important to spotlight people. Uh, but I, in advice wise, I would say there's so much power in um, going against your adversity, not just for how um, how it will change perspectives and how it is for other people to see you doing that, but also for yourself. Like I find so much power in when that something seems difficult or impossible to like find a way to do it um, is uh, I, I get strength from that. But in terms of my general advice for everybody going into this kind of career or wanting to pursue a career in it is that it's absolutely possible. And I do, when I do talks at universities, for example, I think there's this kind of strange and completely false idea that this is like a gated um career and maybe it was like 10 years ago but things are so different now and it's so open and anyone can get into this career and it's exciting that people want to come from different backgrounds people want people from different backgrounds and uh it, the doors are open and i think the most important thing is to just be super proactive if this is what you want to do you can just go out and start making little films you can make an instagram account you can start contacting people if if it's even related to doing that master's course that me and Amelia did, you can contact Peter Venn, the course director, who's incredibly warm and loves to hear from people who are excited about it. And actually, I feel like everybody who really wants to do this career, whose dream is really to do this, everybody who has that makes it. It's not one of those things which is completely driven by luck. I mean, there is obviously for everybody a set of lucky experiences and we all have privileges that come from different things or lacks of privilege. But I think the doors are now open to so much more representation. People are excited about that. And I think, yeah, just go and start contacting people, ask people for coffees, talk to people online. That's one of the best things about this new digital landscape and speaking on Zoom. We could all be from completely different parts of the world right now, and it would be exactly the same um, conversation that we're having right now. And in many cases, that has been the, the situation. On wild screen, for example, we were talking to people all over the world. It was very exciting. So yeah, I think it's a different world. It's a changing world and um, yeah, exciting time. I, I, I agree. And I, and I actually think that events of the last year and all of the broadcasters, um, generally speaking, and particularly in the um, natural history industry as well, that the, there's never been more support available for diverse communities than there is now. And, and I, I, I truly, hope and believe that that will continue and I'm sure it will and it's still early days the the, the uh, money has been ring fenced and, and there are plans and we were yet to see those plans come to fruition but um I'm really really positive about it definitely um before we move on to audience questions I did and actually one of the audiences asked this very question that I was going to ask you about your recent experience at BBC Earth and and how you ended up kind of working with them what what happened there can you share that with us yeah well um again I the presenting thing I I was never really I was super nervous about pursuing that career and actually I just love making films I would say that I'm just as much of that side of me as I am a filmmaker um but I uh went to Guyana and I video diaried an expedition uh, we went 300 miles into the interior of the Amazon and I went with my mates from uh, the jungle and we were portaging waterfalls and dragging boats up and we ended it by seeing a jaguar in the wild and it was it was actually in the last kind of day up the river um which you see in the docks but it's never actually how it happens but this time it actually happened like that it was right at the end and I'd given up all hope um and I came back and I um I was working because I founded a film festival uh during my master's and I was doing that and we were getting it ready to take these films around and show them to people and I was doing it through a agent called Joe Sarsby, um, who uh, is absolutely brilliant, uh, an incredible lady, incredible agent. And she uh, saw the rushes and took me on as a client. 
um, from that trip. Uh, so it was completely lucky and totally random, but she took me on from that situation. And then she's been uh, sort of fighting my corner ever since and got me talking to people that I, I would probably never have spoken to, at least not in that stage of my career. And um, I made a relationship with the development team from the BBC, who we've been speaking uh, for a really long time and uh, uh, pitching shows and then them not uh, coming to fruition, which is actually what happens most of the time. Just if anyone wants to be a presenter, it's a lot of rejection. Um, and you've got to be you've got to deal with that because it can be quite tough sometimes. Um, but then work, 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 work at it, and then it can pay off. And what happened basically was uh, Gavin Boyland, the uh, head of development at the NHU, said, um, Tan, can you do two expeditions, please, for BBCF? And I was like, oh, OK, well, I was already planning on going to uh, do this project with the Snowlopper Trust, and it was happening in two weeks. And I was like, Gavin, I mean, I can go, but it'll be two weeks' time. Like, can we get things sorted in that time? And everyone at the BBC... Uh, Ailesh, who's a connection of the master's course, um, were really helpful and really uh, pushed for me. And we we got it. And me and a camera operator called Chris Beard, uh, just us two went together. And we kind of like, both of us collaborated 50%, uh, 50% really. He's an incredible director, incredible camera operator. And I was kind of like sorting all the research out, the producing side of things, and then came back and collaborated with the NHU. And they took the rushes, edited it to, into the series, which is now available to watch on BBC Earth uh, in four parts, which is uh, really, really exciting. So it was, uh, it was just a crazy journey. And hopefully the start of um, many more projects. Yay, that's a, that's a really inspiring um, story and uh, experience, not even a story, an actual experience. Great, mm. thank you. I would say as well, actually just very quickly on that, that um, the real heroes of that story are the local people, because so much of the time we're focused on the animals. And I, I get it, people want to see animals, but really what was so brilliant about that was that those uh, snow leopards are being saved by these incredible scientists and rangers who have millions of different jobs, like from being camera trappers to horseshoers to wolf defenders and all these things. And they work together, uh, an incredible community, and have taken snow leopards from almost extinct to carrying capacity in their country. So really, really cool. Yeah, and um, that, that's, a, a, a th that's a point that was driven home during the Wild Screen Festival as well, actually, is the, the huge appreciation and the reliance on local people when filming out in, in remote areas um, and utilizing their, their knowledge of the landscape of the, of the animals to, to get you the, the shots uh, that you need to, to produce these amazing programs. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you wouldn't be able to do it without, without their support and their knowledge and their help. So yeah, um, it, it, it's a very good point you've made. I'm going to start answer, asking the uh, audience questions now. There was one um, that came through uh, 4D. Um, D, you kind of already answered this in, in what we were uh, talking about earlier, um, but it, it, was, it was around the barriers and, and what uh, ex barriers that you've experienced both in getting into the industry and um, now working at Icon Films. Um, maybe just kind of expand a little bit more uh, on that for us, if you can. Um, sure. Um, so there are certain barriers if you're from like uh, different disadvantaged um, disadvantaged backgrounds. But as Dan said, there are opportunities out there. Um, Bristol has a lot of um, sort of funding for creatives, young creatives. Um, like diversity programs and stuff like that. It's just a case of like seeking them out and putting in the effort and putting in the work. And yes, it seems a little like bleak sometimes, but um, if you're really passionate about the job, there are, there are opportunities you just have to yeah, overcome the adversity. Yeah, and, and just to say we, you know, Bristol does have a lot of those kind of initiatives and there are those kind of initiatives that are happening um, nationwide in the UK. And going back to what Wildscreen want to do with this Emerging Talent Scheme is we want to go out and reach 
the global audiences as well. Um, and that's ex exactly what we want to be able to do to support emerging talent. So um, what I'd say to the audience is just keep an eye out on what we're doing. Follow us on our social media um, and you, you'll be able to find out more, um, particularly from those that aren't UK based, because we really do want to reach those of you across the world as well. Um, somebody has asked here, how is the TV industry tackling representation and nurturing talent, not only entry level, but from entry level to senior management? Um, I think with this question, because we're focusing uh, on emerging talent as such, but Dan might be able to offer some insights with the work that he's done in the, in the TV industry. Um, and I can uh, talk a little bit more about what the broadcast industry is doing on a general basis. But Dan, do you have any immediate thoughts on that question? Well, the first thing that came to mind is the BBC um, putting uh, 100 million of their existing commissioning budget towards championing diversity. Um, and you can go onto their website and find out exactly what parts of diversity that is um, highlighting. I mean, it's across the board, but it's really got some great key messaging and ideas that they're putting forward. But I think the most important part of that to me at least, is that it's the existing commissioning budget that's being put forward. This isn't like an additional pot of money that's being created that's then like going to be spent. It's the, it's the existing commissioning budget, which means they're really thinking, okay, we need to use this money in the right way. We really need to think about how it's being spent and we need to do it in a proper way. And I think already being the most diverse broadcaster, the BBC is kind of like paving the way for what other people are doing now. And I think it's happening across the board so it's an exciting time but staying in touch with you know um uh with tanya and and, the, and this exact sort of thing is where a lot of that information is going to be kind of proliferating and putting out so i think yeah that's my yeah, absolutely um, um whilst um we were referring it to as emerging talent it's it's regardless of age so we're, we're not saying that you have to be a certain age to be eligible if you've got a passion regardless of your age and we, we we've also noted the fact that COVID has me meant that pe many people have lost their jobs and become redundant and they're having to find a new way forward. Um, and maybe, you you know, this is the time for you to kind of go, if you've had a passion for the natural world and you, you need to kind of try and pave a new career for you, th this could be for you as well. And I would just add to what Dan said with the BBC that Channel 4 in the UK are also doing uh, incredible work in, uh, in creating diversity hubs nationally. Um, ITV have got um, a, a diversity acceleration plan in place. Um, and yes, these are UK centric programs, but they make programs globally and have links with global broadcasters. So it's always worth keeping an eye on what the UK broadcasters are doing and how they're linking up with the international broadcasters um, to, to, to reach truly diverse talent across the globe. Um, Dar Darwood Kreshi uh, has asked, would you suggest moving, for example, to Bristol or anywhere else within better range of production companies for greater chances of work? Amelia, I'm going to ask you that question first, but then I will um, ask Dan's opinion on that too, because Dee's Bristol based and, but Amelia, you, you've, got, you've had the experience of kind of making that decision and coming here. Mm. I do think if I had not come here for the masters, I wouldn't think that as a you know an option just to go and see what happens. But what I've learned coming here, even through the pandemic, there's such a network in Bristol and around Bristol. So even now, but I can't wait for you know normal isn't normal any longer. But when things are a bit more back to socializing and going out and and meeting up with people, there is. I think it's quite an open network. You can definitely, if you go to this place, you can create opportunities for yourselves that might be difficult to make in the same way or the same kind of luck that you'd need. I think coming here definitely brings opportunities. You have to be proactive, but it does, because it fosters such a community of, of this industry, it is a big, there is possibilities. I think without possibilities, I think, it's tricky because of the pandemic. So I can't, you know, I can't say exactly how it is when there's not lockdowns and everything. But I do think, and from what I can hear from people I know who live here already, who are in the industry, they they kind of want to 
my friends asked me when I said I came here for the MA, he said, oh, would you ever consider just going to Bristol anyways? If you hadn't gotten in, would you just go and, you know, find a job? And I was like, I didn't, I, could you do that? Is that, would that even work? But I think it would. I think you can go and, and create opportunities here if you want to. But yeah, I wouldn't have dared to if I didn't have the MA. Yeah. And Dan, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, my initial, my immediate thought is, um, well, actually, do you know, it's twofold. My immediate thought was moving to Brussels, obviously. It's so hard because, yes, it's very helpful. Um, but I would say it's more helpful if you're, if you're quite an extroverted person. Moving to Bristol would be a massive benefit to you because you can go, do you want to go for coffee? And you can go and meet everyone. And that's so helpful because people want to meet people. You can go to all of these little things that are happening. There's like a drinks that happens every last Thursday of the month, wildlife filmmakers drinks that happens down the road um, on White Ladies uh, and Bar Humbug run by a woman called Katie Marie Goodright who runs a specialist camera operator agency. Um, but obviously that's not happening right now. Um, so I would say if you're more introverted and you don't like doing that sort of thing, Zoom is now this brand new world where you can literally have a coffee sat on Zoom with somebody, uh, and that has definitely opened things up in a massive way. Um, and we've seen that affecting so many different things. I mean, CBBC just put out a show uh, recently called Planet Defenders, which has um, a set of uh, presenters from all around the world, um, uh, which is really, really cool. Uh, but I would say if you're around Bristol and if you have the capacity to kind of easily uproot, or if it's kind of a, do I want to do that? Do I not? It's very helpful. But I would say by no means is it a last sort of uh, uh, ticket. And also it's easy to talk to people nowadays on Zoom, sort out the job situation, kind of get the lay of the land a little bit more like that, set yourself up in that way. And then if you want to move to Bristol after that, then you can. Yeah, and I, I, you know, driving home again, the fact that we're looking at this emerging talent scheme here in, at wide screen, the, the reason we've done that is because we, we recognize that a lot of the natural history uh, industry is Bristol centric here in the UK and we want to open it up. So mm. don't kind of be sitting there thinking, oh, I've got to be living in Bristol. Like Dan says, not at all. Utilize um, technology, utilize social media, reach out to people who, whose work you admire um, and get onto Instagram because there's mm. so much amazing natural history content on, uh, on Instagram. So uh, I, I would suggest that. Um, now I'm just going to have a look here because some of these questions we've already covered. Um, let's have a look. Uh, here's, here's one from somebody called Chris Cook. Would you have advice for people who want to be a wildlife presenter and want to work on high end productions, but unfortunately can't move to Bristol? I'm in Australia. We no longer have a natural history unit in this country, unfortunately. Um, I think it's just it's exactly what we've just said now, isn't it, Dan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's just to reiterate that it's a totally new world now. I know people who like did the masters that m me and Emily did. I mean, I'm not going to say any names right now, but who uh, were working at the BBC and now have literally just gone to another country uh, with their job because they realised that they could just do it over Zoom. And so they're just not in England anymore, but they're still doing exactly the same job. Nothing has changed whatsoever. They're just doing their job from another country in Europe. Um, and so I think having uh, meetings has just completely changed that. And especially presenting wise, I mean, yeah, get in touch with people at the NHU, get in touch with development teams um, and come up with your own ideas for shows. I think there's so much of this thing where like nowadays, literally just look up online, read some books. There are some fantastic books about storytelling out there and developing ideas and develop an idea that you think is personal to you, uh, that you would be a really interesting voice um, uh, to tell that story, especially if it's very personal to you, and then send that idea in a treatment document to the Natural History Unit's development team. And I know it's, it sounds really awful to do cold emails. Do try and get the personal connection first. Instagram is a really great one for that and make a soft introduction about yourself. But like, go get it. You yeah. go, girl. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There was a question here that seems to have um, disappeared, but it was around writing um, cover letters and a, and, a, and a CV for initial 
um, entry points, which I think is a really good question. I can't see um, can't see it here now, but I do want Dee to answer that question since you recently got your um, roller icon and it was through writing a cover letter and um, submitting a really good CV. So what advice can you give and share for people on that? Um, my advice? Um, I was really too scared about writing cover letters, but I realised that um, the people I'm up against the jobs are equally as like accomplished. Everyone's doing a lot of work. So it was, I started focusing on um, talking about how conscientious I would be and that I would do the job well. And I am like talking about being part of a team and stuff rather than just listing all the things that I've done that have my degree and like, stuff like that. That's how I used to structure a cover letter, just focus on yeah, the passion I have for the job and how well I would do the job. Yeah, uh, and that that definitely did come across. And, you know, just to reiterate, Dee didn't study zoology, she studied journalism. It was still a creative um, uh, degree, but you 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 made it work and you were doing other things on the side and you were doing the filming projects that you said and, and reaching out to... to uh, charities and organizations that could support you and I and I think if if people can try and do some research around the local charities that are available specifically for creatives that will really really help you um, in the UK there's the organizations like creative access as well that can really help so have a look to see what's in country for you um, in addition to uh, looking at keeping an eye on what we're doing at, at wild screen as well uh, that's that one done. So um, we're at we're at midday. Um, I'm I'm going to uh, allow another five minutes if uh, that's all right with everybody on the panel, um, just to to answer these um, few questions. Um, I uh, here you go. Here's one from um, Raquel Hansen, and it's for you, Amelia. It says, uh, Amelia, you said you are interested in being a camera operator. What is your advice for women wanting to pursue that career? Oh, I think um, there was actually a really good, there was a really good talk about this um, yesterday on Clubhouse actually hosted by some of the previous people who've been on this MA. I think mainly it's about sort of not doing it. I'm not doing it yet, but not holding yourself back not um because personally i'll be like oh i need to know exactly how this camera works until i can tell someone i can use it but you need to sort of encourage yourself and also reaching out i i think there's such a it's kind of it's still you know it's it's becoming a very broad um it's a growing community of female uh, camera operators within both drama and natural history all across the, the board and connecting with those people, chatting to them, reaching out on Instagram or finding an email or a Facebook group. And um, there are lots of stuff out there. And I'm happy to also, if anyone wants to know about these groups, um, send me a message on Instagram or anywhere and, and ask me because I think if we can help each other, if we can help encourage each other to, to do this and get into the industry, the camera side because it's generally quite a male dominated area i think working together is definitely gonna gonna help lift that and the opportunities are out there and also if you start as dan was talking about making these connections with people who are sort of in the industry or working to get into the industry having those connections with each other who are genuine you will help each other out so if there's an opportunity you think would be suitable for someone you would you know send them a message and advise on where to go and what people to to work with i think that would be a a good way to go about it i'm hoping that we all <laughs> help each other out but i think that's the that's the tendency yeah absolutely and what i would encourage people to do is um, check out Wild Screen's uh, Instagram account and look up their followers because many of their followers are um, uh, women who are wildlife filmmakers and photographers. Follow the likes of Nat Geo and Nat Geo Wild um, on Instagram as well. And again, you can look up the followers and see who who are the people that are doing the kind of work that you want to do. And um, you, you'll, you'll be able to, to, to find links there. So thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> following all these 
inspirational people really yeah yeah absolutely i'm going to uh ask one more question um and it's from uh, a person called thatcher bean and they say uh how can other filmmakers producers and production companies plug in support plug in to support this effort i as a filmmaker helped um, to run a not-for-profit production company based in kigali rwanda focused on training filmmakers, featuring local conservationists and expanding the natural history film industry into the areas where filming often takes place. Um, Dan, do you have any kind of tips or links um, with people on, on, on that front in terms of um, what can other filmmakers and producers do to plug into the effort? I think it's about like, it's, it's one of those difficult things because I feel like we all want we want the uh, diverse side. I'm just thinking about, so people like um, camera operators, for example, find it very difficult if they're based here um, for this to happen. But I think it's so important that we start looking at local places for talent in those places as well as nurturing people here. Everyone here is going to be able to continue doing the things that they do. But I think we do need to start looking at local places and spotlighting people who really have incredible skill sets in these local places and actually are saving a lot of money as a production when you do that sometimes. I know a guy actually um, in the jungle in uh, the Amazon who has almost never left region nine of Guyana his whole life. He's uh, 20 years old and he is a fantastic camera operator and he's learned everything he knows by being the son of a fixer who helps um, companies like the BBC when they go out there and he just sits there and he learns everything, absolutely everything. And he is now a prodigy. And they could, I think what would be so fantastic is if there's schemes uh, that production companies themselves will do when they, maybe they're going out on a, on a shoot. Because there are lots of things that people are doing at the moment, which is like, how do you uh, add sustainability as an important part, shoot sharing and these sides. But I think it's also related to people. How can we um, enrich the communities that we're going to when we're making productions and I think one of them could be a mentorship program so if you're going out there maybe you're out there for six weeks there's somebody who uh, you mentor to be a camera operator for example or maybe somebody who wants to be a researcher or a producer or something like that um, that could be so helpful um, yeah and I think that sort of thing is happening I mean I know that this guy his name is Shannon Holland um will be a very successful brilliant camera operator um and uh yeah I think yeah it's all about giving those opportunities and just thinking about it I think just making sure you're thinking about it when you're doing a production that that's an option as well yeah absolutely thank you for that um Thatcher I sent you a, a, a private message there I'd love to keep in touch and hear about the amazing work that you're doing because that sounds incredibly interesting um right we're we're, we're nine minutes over so uh I'm, unfortunately i know that there were questions that have come in i am going to have to um end our webinar now and um thank just thank you very much to all of our panelists for uh making time to to join us today and supporting uh, our efforts in um what we want to be able to develop with this emerging talent scheme. Thank you very much.